In my last lecture, I mentioned Picasso's jealous reaction to Matisse's painting, The Joy of Life. This painting, Demoiselle d'Avignon, was Picasso's counterthrust, and many art historians consider it to be not only his finest work, but the first true work of modern art. We'll get to our presenter in a moment, but first, a little more about Picasso. Since he painted throughout the 20th century, he straddles a bunch of our isms. He simply can't be confined to a single category. So, for example, this work was painted during what art historians call Picasso's blue period, and there are lots more blue paintings out there. In fact, there are a lot more Picasso's period. Picasso was a child prodigy who became arguably the most important painter of the 20th century. He was producing saleable drawings at the age of nine, and by 1900, when he'd reached the ripe old age of 19, he was turning out a painting every day. He kept painting until his death at age 92, and he died by far the richest artist in history. During this long lifetime, he is estimated to have produced more than 30,000 works of art. Okay, now it is our presenter's turn. I've already mentioned the influence of African art on expressionist painters such as Duran and Matisse. In this painting, the mask motif should be clear. So are the distortion, flattened space, fragmented bodies, and black lines used as a grid or scaffolding. After the brilliant color of the expression is sometimes bright and pure, sometimes harsh and jarring, we now encounter a much more limited palette of pinks, grays, blues, and browns. Actually, art historians debate whether Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is an expressionist work or the first Cubist painting. I've somewhat arbitrarily stuck it into my Cubism lecture. Note, too, that the composition, like Cezanne's still life and landscape paintings, is filled with contradictory points of view, deliberately disorienting the viewer. So, we look down at the table at the bottom of the canvas, but encounter the nudes head on. We see the eyes full face and the noses in profile. The seated figure on the lower right faces her colleagues, but manages to turn her head 180 degrees to take a look at us. We've already seen a move toward abstraction. In the case of Kandinsky, we've already arrived there. But it's important to understand that artists had different reasons for creating abstract art. Some artists, such as Kandinsky and Mondrian, whom we'll encounter soon, were seeking spiritual transcendence, really a kind of escape from a material world into a deeper underlying reality. But especially early in the 20th century, most abstract artists were not so much escaping the material world as trying to distill its essential qualities and capture those qualities in painting and sculpture. The Cubists really fit into this second category. And the Cubists themselves perhaps appropriately splintered into different categories. The movement began with the analytical Cubists, really two men, Picasso and Georges Braque. They saw themselves as dissectors people looking for essential shapes and how these shapes interact with the negative space around them, especially when seen from multiple perspectives and when displayed on a two-dimensional surface. Remember, this is the age of Einstein. Relativistic time and space was all the rage. So here's a very early Cubist painting, just a year after Demoiselle d'Avignon. Picasso is reducing the house and garden to simplify geometric form, but he still maintains a color difference between the house and the garden. We see the same features in this early Cubist painting by Georges Braque. This could almost be a Cezanne. Braque is still moving toward abstraction. But here, Braque pretty clearly arrives in full-throated Cubism. Let's hear from our next student presenter. In analytical cubist paintings, not only the figures fragment, the distinction between the object and its surrounding space breaks down as well. This blurring of positive and negative space is enhanced by the almost monochromatic use of colors. You've heard, I trust, that the Portuguese was a musician that Brock saw in a bar. Notice how Brock looks ask the viewer not only to look for familiar shapes, such as the sound hole in the guitar, but also to read into the painting what we know about the subject. Brock also inserts text into the painting, but it's not a text we can easily interpret. Is the message here that perhaps we need to read meaning into a painting? Certainly Picasso and Brock believe that viewers need to learn how to read and understand Cuba's paintings, just as they had at earlier times learned to read illusionistic paintings that employed linear perspective. 
So analytical cubism basically smashes an object to see all of its individual pieces. The next stage of cubism, which began in 1912, and we don't actually have an example, saw Picasso and Brock taking these individual pieces and reassembling them in a new way. Hence the term synthesis, or putting together. In the process, they invented the collage. Again, none of these works show up on our list, but they do influence works that do, such as Stepanova's photomontage. Stay tuned. So here's an example of synthetic cubism, which is also one of Picasso's most famous works. During the synthetic cubism phase, Picasso and Brock also began incorporating real objects into their painting, such as the rope. Here are three Brock collages with actual newspaper articles glued into the painting. And this one's just fun. The Picasso collage dates from what is known as his Rococo cubist period. Remember Rococo art? Note the evocation of luxury items, the hint of aristocratic decadence. I just think that's fun. And this is actually a sculpture made from sheet metal. Even in his three dimensional, this three-dimensional object, Picasso was playing with the juxtaposition of two- and three-dimensional depictions of space and volume. So we don't have any cubist sculpture on the list, but I wanted you to see some. And let me hit you with one last ism before I close. This one is not on our list. Some artists, most notably the famous architect Le Corbusier, whom we will encounter, criticized cubism. They argued that cubists were too cerebral, too out of touch with the realities of modern life, and especially out of touch with the realities and promise of the machine age. Purists admired what they saw as the clean, functional lines of modern machines, but they were also fascinated by Cuba's dissection of objects in space. Leger is the best known of the purist painters, and in this painting, see how he tries to capture the infrastructure and pulsing life of the modern city. Why are machines pure? I'm not sure, but purism is a good lead into futurism, which is where I'll begin my next lecture. So I don't know if you have any time left. If you do, this video clip gives a fascinating insight into the sources Picasso used to create this iconic work.